Welcome back to the Wingspan Podcast, episode 47. I'm Doug Barak, joined by my co-host Chris Mahalan of Nets Daily, and our special guest. He's played for the Nets G League affiliate, the Long Island Nets, this past season, and he's currently playing overseas with Hal Pal Halon in Israel Basketball Premier League. He's played college at Bucknell and Kentucky. Welcome, Nate Sestina, to the podcast. Thank you for taking some time out of your night to join Doug and I. What's going on, man? Nothing. I, I appreciate you guys having me. Uh, you know, not too late, so, so everything's working out perfectly. Yeah, what time is it over there right now? Uh, 10.40. Damn, okay, so not too late. Not too late. No, nah, no, nah, not at all. Yeah, we'll try not to keep you up too, too late, because I know you got hard work <laughs> the next day. But great to have you on. Thanks for joining us. So you've had a pretty interesting journey, and you played through quite a few teams throughout your career. So can you talk about your journey and where you are today? And you don't have to go too, too into detail, but, you know, give us a general spin of things. Uh, I just, I'm, I'm from a really small town. I uh, played small town high school basketball. Uh, played at university or Bucknell University first. Uh, I had an incredible four years there. Um, won two championships there. And then transferred to the University of Kentucky. Uh, championship there. And, you know, didn't get the opportunity to play in the NCAA tournament because of COVID. But I'm uh, still grateful for my time there, the connections I've made there. And then kind of went through that pre-draft process, which was like eight months long to, uh, uh, you know, end up signing with the Brooklyn Nets uh, on an Exhibit 10, going to training camp. Uh, and then ended up playing for the Long Island Nets in the G League bubble this year. And then once the, the bubble was over, or, uh, me and my agent decided to, you know, Signed my contract to come over to Israel, and uh, I've been here for about a month and like two weeks, and it's just been great. Yeah, it's awesome. So, how has uh, been playing overseas? Like, how's the season for you going thus far in Israel? Uh, it's actually uh, it's it's been incredible. The uh, the team, you know, from our GM all the way down to you know our youngest guy in the team who actually just left to fulfill his requirement of joining the military at age eighteen. Everybody's been, been incredible for me, um, playing with a lot of high-level pros. I'm the youngest guy on our team. Other than, uh, I'm learning from a lot of really good pros and guys that are um, there about the Champions League late, and, and I didn't register for that because I was playing in the G League, but uh, I'm going to go and, you know, practice and, and compete and push those guys so that they're ready to go. And uh, tomorrow actually starts the Balkan League Final Four for us. Uh, and, you know, we win tomorrow, hopefully, and uh, the championships on Thursday. So hopefully just continue to win and, you know, put championships on my resume. Yeah, no, definitely. And something I just thought of is because of your connection with the Brooklyn Nets, ha- did you stay in touch with Coach Stat since he played several times uh, for Maccabi? Yeah, when I was actually at training camp, um, I had talked to him about it, and uh, I had had some friends that had played in Israel before, and I was just asking about his experience and playing for Maccabi, and uh, you know, it's one of the one of the best teams in the world. So, I was just picking his brain about uh, play style, and you know, like the, we were talking about earlier, the culture shock and everything, and uh, and just his experience with it overall, and just really getting a good feel for it. Yeah, and has he taught you any, like, fun phrases in Hebrew or Ivrit? No, he has. I didn't, I didn't actually ask anything like that. We'll, we'll see if I can help you out a little bit. You know, took some Hebrew back in the day. But <laughs> and, So what are some differences in the play style uh, overseas in the, uh, compared to, like, the NBA or, you know, other states and such? I think you, you say play style, you kind of broke up first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So kind of like some of the differences in play style you've seen in overseas compared to back home, NBA, you know, collegiate level. Uh, honestly, I, I think it's fine. Um, they, it, it seems like everybody runs the Princeton offense. You know, they you got a guy in the middle, he takes one dribble, one guy goes back door, do a little dribble handoff, pick and roll. There's not as much... Uh, you know, pick and pop as there is in the NBA or in college now. I feel like American basketball has really transitioned to that. Like everybody can shoot, 
you know, everybody can shoot threes. Uh, there's a select few, obviously, in the NBA, some centers who, who can't. But um, everybody over here is, you know, pick and roll, roll pick and pops, back doors. Uh, it's a, a lot of, like, fundamental basketball. Um, but it's really fast-paced. And I, I think that that was one thing that I was very surprised by. Uh, you know, being at training camp and playing in the G League, I thought that that was fast-paced. And I got over here, and our oldest guy on the team is 37 years old, 38 years old, and he's still moving well. And I'm like, man, like, it's, and it's, it's incredible. So um, I think just the, the play style, is, you know, more roles than there are pick and pop. Our coach actually loves shooting threes, so that's one thing that I was very fortunate to, you know, come into the guy as well. Yeah, so what would you say, like, uh, is the biggest thing you brought to the team so far, like, something that is your claim to fame? Like, what kind of dynamic part of the game? Honestly, or what, it can also be your personality just, as well, you know? A player is more than just what they do on the court. I would so. say just being young. <laughs> just being young. Um, I'm 23. I'm about to be 24 years old, so it's – I like, everybody on my team's 27-plus. You know, they, they've been playing for a long time. I'm, month season so they're not they're a little run down you know energy might not be there all the time so I came in I kind of I did my best to bring like a little bit of a morale boost um and you know I'm just grateful I'm like I said I'm from a really small town and to be a basketball player is just a huge blessing to me so you know every day I wake up I you know I take care of my body I take care of my brain make sure I'm ready to go and I'm just thankful that I get to play basketball for a living and get paid to put a ball in a hoop you know and I got the easiest job. I got practice for two hours a day, and then I play games. You know, some people work long shifts and everything. So I think just, I, you know, having a smile on my face and just being excited to play is something that I definitely brought over here. Yeah, definitely. And then, Nate, I got one question for you, too. Like, you know, with a lot of young guys, especially coming out of college or, like, rookies and G League guys, a lot of them like to kind of say, okay, I want to stay in the States rather than kind of go overseas and, like, develop their game or have that opportunity. Why was why did you choose to kind of go overseas after like one G League season? And if you had to provide advice to anyone that was listening to this, that's kind of was in your shoes after the end of the G League bubble. Why do you think it's always a good idea to go overseas when you still have that gap of play in? Honestly, I think it's just it's important to to stay ready. And you had kind of touched on it just to you know continue to play, hone in on skills that you might not be able to hone in on. Uh, depending on, you know, what team you're with or, you know, the system that you're in. Um, for me, I think being able to, you know, have a little bit of a mid-post game uh, can benefit my game, you know, at the NBA level where it's not just pick and pop the whole time. You know, you can short roll or you can slip to the 15 foot. And then if you have, you know, if you have a little bit of a game there and you can score points there, one through five, whoever's guarding you, uh, I think that, that that can add to my resume, you know, help me get my foot back in the door and, uh, you know, get a knock at the NBA or another chance. And I think that coming over here uh, was just another opportunity for me to stay ready, you know, provided the the summer league is, you know, going to happen this year. It's, it's a huge goal of mine is, you know, to make an NBA roster and, uh, you know, be on an NBA team. So uh, my agent and I had decided that it was, it was best to, you know, get into a situation where my skills would be going to, put forth where I can, you know, shoot threes, I can do all that, but I wanted to work on some things as well. And European basketball allows you for you to do that, you know, a lot of mid post situations and a lot of short rolls. And if they switch, you know, it's not switch, kick out, let the, the guard go at the big. It's a lot of the time, let the big go at the guard in the post. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, so let's, let's move forward to like the, the bubble time, your time in the bubble. Line. So how was that experience overall for you? It was incredible. You know, the, the G League did such an uh, amazing job of uh, taking care of everything for us, you know, housing, food, uh, COVID testing, COVID protocols. Uh, but also, you know, you didn't, you didn't feel trapped in there. Uh, there were areas where, you, you know, you could hang out at the pool. There are areas for you to play games. Uh, you had a team, team room that had Xbox or PlayStation, TV, ping pong. That was a huge thing for our, our team was ping pong. Uh, I think Ellie, Ellie and CJ Mass might have been the best play just you know it was kind of like an extended just being that that young guy's how I kind of viewed it um but it I definitely learned a lot about myself and I learned a lot about that 
Mm-hmm. And then looking back on it, was was the bubble something that you expected going in? I guess obviously with the bubble, everything's more safety focused with obviously protocols, getting tested every day. But when you look back on that experience and when you look in going into it, what was kind of some of the things that surprised you about the bubble? I think the amount of games that we were able to play in such a short amount of time. I think we played 15 games in 25 days. And that's just nuts. Even for me, like I, you know, like I said, I'm young, so I, I'm, I wake up, I'm ready to go. But even for like our older guys on our team too, like it was just, it was incredible that our, our health and you know, make sure that we were ready to go every single day. Um, and just the like competitive nature of each game, even if you're coming off of a back to back, like the back end of that game and fight and you're still playing hard, you know, and then you have a little bit of time to rest. But I think just the ability to play that many games in that amount of time and, you know, compete. And I think that that was something that uh, everybody on our team was looking forward to. Mm-hmm. And obviously compared to like the last G League season, this one was shorter, right? It was, I think it was 15 games and something amount of days. I think it was 35, 40 days. So mm-hmm. when you look back on that, especially with your development, because obviously, you know, with G League, it's all about developing your game and kind of taking that next step. So how would you kind of sum up the development? Was it, do, do you see it as obviously with time kind of goes away from the development, but would you, how would you kind of just sum it up? Honestly, I was able to, I was able to kind of fine tune some things uh, with, you know, coach Brett when T was the man, he, uh, he just really gave me a lot of confidence. Um, my teammates gave me a lot of confidence. Uh, but a lot of it actually came from film. Jimmy Oakman and, and uh, you know, Ben Sanders and Chase and Luca were just incredible. And uh, film helped me out, I think, more than anything. Uh, knowing when to shoot, when to, you know, don't, you know, I got yelled at for pump faking all the time, but, you know, knowing when to shoot, how to guard certain things, like when, when you're switching, how to do it, how to move your feet better. I, that's one thing that I'd always struggled with. But uh, film was huge. And then taking advantage of practice. That's the uh, not just going in there and, you know, chucking up 100 threes, but, you know, really focusing in on my workout. I'd rather get, you know, 50 makes and 100 total threes shot because, you know, you might only make 30 of them, but if you get 50 makes, so uh, just, I think, taking advantage of the time. Mm-hmm. And you talked about Brett, right? So obviously Brett, this past season, you guys talked about the whole season, right? He was an energy guy, really thrived off his energy, and obviously his resume speaks for himself. He was on the Cavs when they won. And he's just got a lengthy history of being an assistant across the league, especially with the Nets. So how would you kind of sum up, like, Brett's coaching style? You know, like I mentioned, he's an energy guy, but, like, kind of, like, learning under him, like, how would you just kind of sum up what type of coach he is? i tell you what, his his X's and O's during the game, oh, my, like, he could draw up a play for a certain situation and – it just worked, and I'm like, there's no way that every single time this guy drops a play, it's going to work. And I'm not joking. I think 90% of the time, 95% of the time, it did. You know, a guy might have missed a screen or, you know, the guard might have done something a little different and, and thrown it off. But if we ran it the way he drew it up, it it worked. And uh, But I think one thing that he did a really good job of is, is allowing that so he'd come in into a huddle, big all right, what, what, what do we see? And guys would speak up, and then, like, he would draw a play based off of what we just told him. And, you know, guys are going under screens. Guys are slipping it. They're cheating it. And we would draw and, you know, turn your hips somewhat, a certain way for screens. And just I think his ability to uh, adapt and allow us to ha- kind of help him out um, is going to help him, you know, when he gets into a head coaching position. And, and I, I don't doubt it for one second that he, he'll be a head coach in the NBA soon. Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. And then moving on a little bit. So you had that. So I guess we'll, we'll, we'll top off the G League with this. Like when you look back at it, what were some of your biggest takeaways? Switching one through five is huge. I think that that's one thing that uh, I'm, I'm continuing to work on. Um, communication is huge. Uh, and just I think the the – the biggest takeaways too are, you know, you got to win games no matter what. You know, you got to dive on the floor. It doesn't matter who you are on the team, whether you, you know, you're a guy in two way or you're, you know, the bottom guy in the roster. You're, you know, regular guy, whatever it is. You have to play with energy and effort. And if you don't, then you won't play. And I think that, uh, and it doesn't matter who you are as well. If you know, if you you say something to the coach or you back talk or anything, it's like 
and it, like, this is your job, but this is also his job too. So, you know, he wants to win games. We want to win games, but uh, just, you know, coming together and, and playing and, you know, we, we are able to throw together a roster and, and compete. And I think that that's something that Matt did a great job of is putting a, a roster together that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then, so when a you. A lot of really good guys. Mm-hmm. And then with Brooklyn, obviously, like we talked about, you were on the exhibit 10, you went to training camp with them, right? And I've covered Long Island for a couple of years now. And one thing I noticed is year after year, they teach what they're teaching in Brooklyn. They pass that down to Long Island, right? So when you were with Brooklyn in the training camp and learning with those guys, did you pick apart? And obviously when you got to Long Island, it was different. But when you, when you got, when you see both sides of everything, do you see that coaching and development wise perspective and those clear similarities that you saw? A hundred percent. It was almost like they were the same thing. Honestly, uh, every day we would watch film, you know, one T would come in and be like, this came right from, you know, coach Nash, or this came right from RFK and whoever, you know, whatever coach had talked to him the night before we, you know, we're, we're doing this or this, the play calls were the same. The terminology was the same. So, you know, if you're, you know, blessed enough to get the opportunity to get that call up, beats you just, you're boom, you're right in, you're ready to play. Uh, so I think that the ability to have that and, you know, and kind of translate both levels allows for uh, guys to get up there and get to be, be mm-hmm. successful. Mm-hmm. And then when you, if you want to look back on just the time that you were with Nets in the training camp, right? What were some, what was it like playing with like that star sled Nets group? Obviously on one side of the court, you got KD on the other, on the top, you got Kyrie. And obviously being a kid like you, you know, obviously you just got out of college. So what was it like seeing, kind of just playing with those guys and what was kind of some of your main takeaways from just being in Nets training camp? Honestly, it was, uh, it was a dream come true for me. You know, being, Mm -hmm. like you said, being in the gym with those guys is, uh, is amazing. And I think that the, 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 one of some of the biggest takeaways I took, like took from them was honestly was one was from Jeff Green. He's just always talking on defense and offense, setting good screens, knowing when to screen, knowing when to slip. And, you know, really paying attention to his footwork on that. Uh, watching Joe Harris shoot, every time he shot in a drill, it was the same way he shot in a game. And, he, you know, he's one of the best shooters in the, in the world. And, and the way that, you know, he scrimmaged, the way he shot in, in drills was the exact same. Uh, obviously, everybody wants to talk about superstars all the time. You know, Kevin Durant is unbelievable. You know, his, his ability to make shots doesn't matter anywhere on the court. Kyrie's layup layup package is ridiculous. You know, DeAndre Jordan rebounds everything. So, uh, and I actually, I'm, I'm good friends with Tyler Johnson. So uh, mm-hmm. when I came into camp, Tyler was excited. And my, my first day there, he came out and gave me a big hug. But uh, and I, I'm hoping he's, but it's just being there and learning and just watching. I think watching was, was better than everything because I, I could just, I could soak it in. You know, mm-hmm. you, you watch an NBA game from your TV, you're like, oh, okay but just appreciating how good these guys really are uh, and, and how big they are, too. It's, it's ridiculous. Kevin Durant is almost seven feet tall, shooting 40-foot threes like they're, you know, like they're free throws. So awesome experience and, and just appreciating, appreciating the game more than anything and you know, not taking it for granted. Mm-hmm. And then now, now that you're in Israel and everything and that your time with the Nets kind of obviously it ended with the bubble and everything, but you talked, you have a good relationship with TJ. Is there any still guys that you still talk to today that provide you advice? You still got those FaceTimes with Long Island guys, like any guys you keep in contact with still? Yeah, actually our, our Long Island team, you know, we have a, a team group chat. So, you know, we hit hit each other up every once in a while, check in on everybody. And, uh, uh, just, you know, I, I had talked to Tyler uh, a couple of weeks ago. You know, he was like, congratulations on, on signing another contract. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just another another stepping stone for me to, you know, get back and, you know, get an, get another chance. And he said that's what it's all about, you know, taking advantage of the opportunities that are, are presented to you. Um, and I was actually able to work out with uh, Tyrese Halliburton and some of the guys that have been drafted. And, you know, obviously Emmanuel Quickly and those guys. But last summer I was able to work out with them. So I... I reach out to them and, and pick their brains about things and just, I'm, I'm excited. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, then how, mm-hmm. and then how do you know, how do you know Tyler Johnson? Like, is there like a past relationship or was it this, more training camp? This is going to be the craziest story, but I worked out in uh, California last summer and, and Tyler's from California and 
he his little brother plays at St. Mary's, and uh, my agent played at St. Mary's, so that there's you know big time connection there. And uh, my agent knows Tyler really well. And I was working out on a, a winery and like a vineyard out in California last year, and we were playing pickup one day, and uh, Tyler uh, Tyler came with his brother to play pickup, and I was like, he he pulled up and. The crazy thing, you know, Tyler signed that contract with the Heat, and you would never know. He pulled up yeah. in like a, you know, 2010 Toyota Corolla with his brother, <laughs> baggy shorts, baggy shirt. We're into the gym. He wore those to play. We went up and like swam. Like he's just like the the nicest, most down to earth guy. Um, you know, we had like a big barbecue afterwards, but uh, you know, he just he kept coming up to play, and I I just kept picking his brain about his his journey. You know, getting consecutive ten days, and then you know, signing that contract with the Heat, getting traded to Phoenix, and I was, and he was like, "Dude, just keep chipping away." And like I said, take advantage of every opportunity that that is presented to you, and uh, uh, that's whatever thrown my way. Just take full advantage of that, and you know, create connections because you never know where those can take you. Yeah, well, here in Brooklyn, we call it nets working. So as bad as <laughs> bad as my, I had to get one bad joke in. Uh, so while we're on the conversation in nets. <laughs> Uh, have you watched any NES games this season? And what are your thoughts on the team and what kind of stands out right now? I was I watched a lot of games in the bubble. Uh, I got league pass. It, it's, it's hard for here. Uh, they do show some of them on, on, the t- on TV. And sometimes they're in English, sometimes they're in Hebrew. So when they're in Hebrew, I just, I don't understand it. And I, I just mute it and put some music on or something. But um I'm, I I have watched a couple of the games since I've been here, and I think with a fully healthy team, they're they're going to be really really hard to beat. Uh, and it's not just with like I said, it's not just with superstars. You know, they have an incredible you know background of players that are you know hardworking guys that are going to you know bind to their role. They want to win a championship, and I think that you know with a hundred percent fully healthy roster, this could this could be a team that could really do that. So something you brought up a good point, you know, the back end, guy, like the guys who really beef up the team, the core, the bench, like, how do you think that kind of related to your, like your experience on Long Island? Like those kind of guys have a very strong parallel to each other. And like that. Grit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that that's one th- grit, I think is, is a word that, that one T used all the time. Uh, like we had our, our starting five uh, in Long Island. And then it was like, you know, you have those next three guys. It was always like me. Shannon and sometimes Tariq or sometimes Paul. And it was like, you know, you have to come in with that same energy and effort and bring, you know, if you're not bringing, you know, the 22 points a game that BJ scoring, then you got to go in and play with the same kind of energy, get us a rebound, get us a stop, dive on the floor for a loose ball, take a charge. Excuse me. But um, I think that Brooklyn has, has those guys too. You know, when Tyler's healthy, Tyler's not afraid to dive on the floor for a loose no. ball. You or know, lose Jeff some Green's teeth along the way. Hey, that's what I was <laughs> say. Uh, you know, Jeff Green's not. You know, Jeff Green's an older guy on the team, but he's not afraid to get down on the floor. He's not afraid to get in and box out, get rebounds, switch one through five. So, uh, I think having that on, on both levels, uh, really, I from before too, it, it just helps translate the game. Yeah, no, we we definitely saw that in the first ever uh, Nets bubble. Um, and that kind of nickname and resolve really stood out, um, especially for a great example. I don't know if you got to catch the uh, 76ers game where we were getting blown out and all of a sudden we mount a comeback. We could have won, but let's not get into that at the moment. But <laughs> it, it, it shows that that grit that you're talking about. So it's really great to see that it's on all level and aspects of the franchise. Um, so kind of like to round it out with the Nets. Like, do you think they can win it all? What do you think needs to happen? Who do you want to see them play in the playoffs? Whether it's like your fan or, you know, how your mind takes it. Like, do you want to see like them always play the best? Do you want to see them, you know, doesn't matter. Just anyone just put a line them up, knock them down. Like what are your kind of expectations going forward for the season and for the playoffs? Uh, honestly, like I said, I think if, you know, if, if they're a hundred percent healthy, uh, I was a, a huge Lakers fan growing up. Uh, Kobe Bryant was my favorite player of all time and will, will forever be my favorite player. Um, so I think, you know, a fully healthy Lakers team versus a fully healthy Nets team, uh, you know, we'll, we'll bring back that, like, Cleveland Cavaliers-esque 
game, you know, that esque series. That it's just two Titans going at it. And I hope it goes seven games. I'd love that. You know, oh, yeah. you get extra basketball from some of the best in the world. Uh, better than that. But um, I think if if you're gonna play in the East, I, I would love to see them either play, you know, Philly or or Milwaukee. My love seeing Tyrese Maxey out there for Philly. Maybe even New York with Emmanuel quickly. I I love seeing Emmanuel and Tyrese doing well and love seeing their success. But uh, you know, I hope obviously I hope Brooklyn comes out of the East. And uh, I think if if I had to choose a team, I hope they played a, a fully healthy Lakers team as well. It'd just be it'd make for a really fun finals. Um, obviously, I'd hope. Brooklyn would, would take on the NBA championship and, you know, bring bring back some some hype to to New York City and, you know, continue to have that, you know, as, every, as long as everybody stays with the, the team next year and everything and um, just bring back a, a championship and, you know, kind of get that hype going again in New York City. Yeah, no, it definitely should be an amazing experience. Hopefully the time zones will work out for you so you can watch some of these games, hopefully live. I, I know that was one of my issues when I was in Israel on a trip. We were, I found out the next day Joe Johnson took so game winner over uh, Serge Ibaka a couple years ago. So I hope you don't have to wake up that you can experience it live when that <laughs> when that ball drops and we hear the buzzer. Yeah. If, if I have to, I'll stay up. I'm, I'm <laughs> Living and breathing basketball. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> but Nate, let's talk about before you went pro, right? So, like, you play you 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 play college ball at Bucknell and Kentucky, right? So, obviously, those are kind of two mm-hmm. different programs. So, what what was it like playing at both those programs? And when you transferred to Kentucky, was it a big adjustment for you? Uh, to answer your first question, playing at Bucknell was was incredible. I, I have you know, my three best friends in the whole world uh, were the guys that came in with me, and uh, and they're doing great in in life right now too. You know, my, my one buddy, Matt, selling commercial real estate in San Francisco, and he's killing it. Uh, Nate Jones is about to go to law school, and uh, Kimball McKenzie's actually playing in Spain right now. So Kimball will continue to play, and, and he's going to play again, you know, for as long as his, his body allows him to play. And um, just I, I really grew and felt, but I, I grew a lot as a person there. Uh, it was a big culture shock for me there. I'm from the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania, and you go, obviously, Bucknell's not in some city, but it's there, you know, come from New York City, Boston, all very wealthy areas on the East Coast, and it's a huge culture Mm -hmm. show. I grew a lot as a person, you know, I I ended up getting hurt my freshman year, so as crazy as it's going to sound, I'm very grateful for that. Um, It makes me appreciate basketball a lot more, Um, and then... At the end of my four years there, I, you know, I wanted to grow and, and develop a little bit more, and I put my name in the transfer portal. As you're seeing, everybody who does that is their their phones are probably blowing up and everything. And uh, I was fortunate enough to have a very successful senior year, and you know, I was really grateful for the the people who had reached out to me. It was some some big time schools, and I was very very shocked. So I was like, man, I was hoping to get, you know, some some really good, you know high level mid major teams or maybe even some like lower high major teams and I was just shocked when Coach Cal called me and you know he's like, Hey Nate's John Cal Perry. I put my phone on mute and I was like, there's no way I'm on the phone with him right now. You know? And uh he was just like, you know, I I, I watched film on you all, all night and like they were in the NCAA tournament. He's like, oh, I love your game, you know, I love how much you you know how even when you're on the bench, like your first guy off to five, he's a guy I think, you know, bringing a, a fifth year guy like that that can, you know, help teach our young guys that would, would benefit our program, but it would also benefit you. And I got there, I was like 265 pounds. I was coming off of a foot injury. And uh, June 3rd, I weighed in like 265. And July 27th, uh, I weighed 234. A lot of weight in a short amount of time, but. Uh, I had to in order to play there. I, I could not have played at, at a heavy weight. Um, and, but it just, another thing is that helped, you know, kind of build into that appreciating the game. And I learned a lot. And I learned a lot from, you know, Tony Barbie, Joel Justice, Kenny Payne, who's with the Knicks now. Uh, and our strength coach, Rob Harris, a lot of life lessons. You know, it's a lot bigger than basketball. And, you know, creating those relationships. And because you never know, like, whenever I'm done playing, you know, Joel's going to be a head coach. Like, where should I start? You know, he might have an assistant. So, 
just it's a lot bigger than just putting a ball in a hoop and, and playing. So I think those are that's one of my biggest takeaways from playing there. And it was a huge adjustment. The speed of the game there is nuts. You have a lot of guys that are going to be NBA players that play there. So uh, trying to guard Tyrese Maxey in a pick and roll, especially when I was heavy, it was terrible. I couldn't move my feet. And I'm, I'm, these guys are looking at me like, what is this kid doing here? He can't play here. So uh, I think losing all that weight helped me and it kind of gained their trust that I'm willing to work really, really hard. And uh, I'll do whatever it takes for, for me and for, for the team to, to win. Mm-hmm. And looking back at it, what was it like learning under Cal, right? Because, like, Coach Cal, obviously, is one of the best coaches, really, of collegiate of all time. And then, hugely, I know you talked about the type of program they have there, but, like, what type of what type of program do they have that you notice that, like, sticks out? Like, if you had to take a recruiting approach and say, hey, this guy wants to play K- Kentucky, what would you tell him about the program? It's It really is players first. Um, mm-hmm. No matter what it was, we have, you know, like – NBA level locker room facilities, like our living facility, all of it. You know, you have the best weight room, you have the best gear, you have a Nike contract that is just ridiculous. You know, every couple of days you get a new pair of shoes, you, you know, you get a new sweatsuit, you get a winner or coat. Mm-hmm. I'm like, man, I didn't wear the same pair of socks for like three straight weeks. And I was like, what is <laughs> going on here? You know, but uh, I think that just for me, that was a huge shock. You know, you went from a mid-major school that has a certain budget to, you know, you're going to a borderline NBA team that, you know, you can go and you can get dinner and you could get whatever you want. You know, you can, anything that you needed. We like, we got massages for the whole team all the time. Take care of your body. Rest and like rest and recovery was so big. Uh, state of the art facilities, like the weight room. Um, it was pretty much like whatever you needed, you know, for you to be your best player and the best person uh if you needed you know mental health coach there's one ready to go uh our trainer jeff was incredible he was with the phoenix suns for a couple years so he came in brought all that nba knowledge anything that like you needed from jeff like boom it was done you know when i broke my wrist uh i got surgery the next morning like i broke my wrist at like 7 p.m and i was in the hospital i got my x-ray and everything and i was in the hospital the next day at six for surgery at eight you know so um Anything that any of our players ever needed, it was done like it would faster than you can snap your fingers, pretty much. So the kid was like, Hey, I want to go to Kentucky. It's hard though, it's really, really hard. You know, that's the biggest practices are hard. You compete every single day, doesn't matter if you have a game the next day, like you're playing five on five, you're running stuff, uh, you know, you're bumping every day. And I think that towards the end of the season, I think that's what separated us from teams was how much better in shape we were mm-hmm. you know you're on sprints every day so it's not like you're you know you don't take days off there and uh so i think you know it is players first but it's hard mm-hmm. you're mentally tough you're physically tough enough to sur- survive anywhere you want to play mm-hmm. and when you were at kentucky you're obviously like you mentioned teammates with Emmanuel click quickly right so Obviously, he's thriving in New York right now. He's really making a name for himself over there. So are you surprised by his success? And what do you think of his success so far? Uh, honestly, I'm not surprised by it. And, and everybody's probably going to say that. But I, I've i never met a kid who works harder than him. Uh, I, truthfully, he early morning, late at night. I don't think he slept, honestly. Uh, I think that 15 years old, you know, you don't, you don't care about uh, He was the hardest working kid. I had ever seen after games, he's in the gym, you know, you want to go and you want to, you know, play some video games, you want to eat, whatever. Like he's in the gym, full sweat. You know, he just had 28 against, you know, whoever Auburn or somebody back in the gym, working out, boom, boom, boom. Uh, I think that's what really separated him though, is he had a vision and a goal for himself. Uh, A lot of people didn't see, and it didn't matter that those other people didn't see it. He did. Mm-hmm. Really believed it and you know he's a really faithful kid and he's my roommate on, on road you know we just talked a lot and he was just like dude like i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do this and i was like you're doing it right now he's like no no, no. like i like i'm gonna make it i was like all right and i, I would always just joke about i was like he's just you know he was one of my best friends when i was there and uh, i'm just so happy for him and his family he comes from a great family and uh you know his mom and his aunt were at every game so uh, or as many games as they can get to. And it's it's just, it's incredible to see his success. And I'm really happy for him. 
Mm-hmm. And the one guy I forgot to ask you about with Long Island is you were down there with Reggie Perry for the whole bubble, right? So mm-hmm. what, a lot of these guys, a lot of Nets fans don't really know what to expect out of him because he hasn't, he hasn't playing that much in Brooklyn. But for someone that's really worked out with him, you know, you're in that same position gap. I can imagine you guys worked a lot down there together. And what can what can you tell like fans about Reggie Perry and what can he like bring to the table in the future? Uh, Reggie, honestly, he ever you know he's a he's a big strong kid. Uh, he rebounds really well. He can push the ball up the floor too. And I, that honestly, that surprised me a couple of times. He'd grab a rebound and bring it up the court, and I'm like, oh crap! You know, if he can do this and he can do that in the NBA, like he's in the NBA for a long time. Uh, he worked a lot on on his ability to shoot the three, and I think that that's uh, if if he gets it to where you know he's shooting that thing 35 plus percent, he's going to be a dangerous kid because you know. He's quick. He's kind of shifty. He can put the ball on the floor. He can dribble. He's got a really good mid-post game. Uh, he can shoot that 15-foot jump shot. He's got some. Uh, he's got some stuff in his bag, as, as one T would always say. But uh, you know, he's he's kind of deceptive. You know, he's like deceptively quick. Mm-hmm. And like this big, strong dude, and he's uh, and he he dunks. You know, he dunks everything for us. He was he was incredible. He really helped us out. Uh, I'm pretty sure he averaged 20 and 15 the whole time he was down there. It was like, you know, three things are inevitable. It was like death, taxes, and Reggie having 20 and 15. So uh, I think things that, that fans can really look forward to is, uh, you know, his growth and development. He's 20, 21 years old, right? So he's got a long ways to go in for his career. I mean, and I'm excited to see his growth and development. What was it like guarding each other in practice? Did you guys go out a little bit extra, like that brotherhood vibe? Yeah. Uh, the the first couple of days he was there, he was in quarantine. You know, and, uh, I closed out short, and he he shot a three. And just me being me, I was like, oh heck no, I did that. Out like, <laughs> and he made it, and he's a and he started talking. So I was like, oh okay. So then I came down, I came up down like a like a stagger, and I hit a three. I gave him like a little smack on the butt, and then he just he and I just like kind of went back and forth for a little bit, and it these practice is over, like that competitive gone, like just a couple of kids, you know, back in the like playing and you know playing ping pong, and uh, Ellie was crushing everybody in ping pong, so I didn't like playing against Ellie, but uh, Reggie, like you know, that competitive, like he could flip it on and off, um, but in practice he was hard to guard, especially that that fifteen foot, if he caught it in his you know, and he was in the position he wanted to get to, like, it was hard to move him off that. So, uh, but every day was, was a competition, you know, practices were, especially towards the end of the bubble, like, you couldn't play as much five on five, but we would do like three on three scenarios. It was hard to guard. Yeah, no, I mean, definitely seen some bits of that, but I mean, couldn't say it any better of how to get excited when he gets those minutes on a more regular basis. But looking ahead, what's next for you, Nate? Like, what do you got? What do you think's next big thing for you? How do you plan to spend uh, your off season? And what are some of your big goals coming up besides some Call of Duty in between? <laughs> uh, definitely some Call of Duty. That's uh, that keeps me sane. No, uh, honestly, the the summer I'm going to be out in Las Vegas uh, working out at Impact. Uh, that's where I was last summer as well, and uh, I got a lot better when I was out there. And uh, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. So it's I'm going back out there going to train this summer and. Uh, you know, prepare myself for the summer league is, you know, God willing that it happens. And, you know, and I'm able to, to get onto a team there and just, you know, compete and, you know, and, and push for that, that ultimate dream of mine is to, to play in the NBA and, you know, to kind of push that. And uh, I don't think it's a far fetched dream. You know, I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm right there knocking on the, uh, you know, I have, a, I have some things I need to develop and, you know, work on, uh, you know, to get there, but I feel like I'm knocking on the door and, you know, I'm just, I'm waiting for somebody to let me in and, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm excited because this summer is huge for me and in my development and my growth. And I feel like if I, I can fine tune some things that, uh, I feel like I can really, really get there. Anyways, man, I really, really appreciate you joining us, Nate, taking some time out of your night, uh, join Chris and I enjoy the COD. Uh, hopefully we'll catch you on Warzone once, uh, Chris is done playing Fortnite for a little bit, but, uh, Man, not Fortnite. Bro, I got That's a, all right. I, we'll let him rock with Fortnite. Xbox. I've been, I've been, uh, I've tried out a little bit of like, I'm, I'm still a GTA guy, even though the game's old. I play a little bit of G. And at the same time, like, I don't know. I don't really got to, 
playoffs, dude. I, I don't got too much time to, to crank out some video games. So I got when I when I get some games, I get them going. But Nate, man, I know you're working hard over That's, there. I can't to see what's next. For. See, I, uh, yeah, I but, appreciate you guys, and thank you very much for having yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So one last thing, if you uh, just let everyone know where to find you on social media, where you want to be found, you know, to see all the progress you've been making. Plug away. Uh, on, on Instagram, uh, Nate Sestina four, and then on, on Twitter, I'm uh, Nate Sestina twenty three. There you go. And all those stuff will be down in the description. But, guys, remember, feel free to send over any suggestions, questions, comments, or thoughts on any of our content by sending an email to wingspanpodcast at gmail.com. And do not forget to follow us on social media. But most importantly, make sure you subscribe to our podcast and your preferred listening service. As for next time, stay classy and take care.